Yeah, we're good. Buenas tardes. My name is Ira Williams Figueroa. I am the director of the Grevia Racial Equity Building Institute for the Americas, a program of Fundación Comunitaria Puerto Rico. And I will be welcoming you to this breakout room. A local perspective on economic justice, challenges, and innovations in Puerto Rico. Now I will introduce you to the panelists. We are leaders of two of the powerhouses in the third sector in Puerto Rico, Dr. Colón, Nelson Colón Terraz, Executive President of Fundación Comunitaria de Puerto Rico, and Ms. Tania Rosario Mendez, Executive Director of Taller Salud. Hello, everyone. Hello. So we jump right in. Um, Puerto Rico has faced many economic challenges, prolonged economic recession yeah. aggravated by Hurricane Maria and the pandemic. In your opinion, what are the top economic challenges unique to Puerto Rico? We will start with Tania Rodriguez Mendez, followed by Dr. Nelson Colón Terrazas. Uh, okay, challenges unique to Puerto Rico. Uh, there are more challenges than we can fit in this um in this 45 minute session. Um I wanted to uh, maybe synthesize the four that I think are um the most pressing ones that are um probably unknown or it is it's a little what you know uh, about it outside of the island. Um and we won't be able to expand a lot, but uh, hopefully you'll get a glimpse of, of, uh, of challenges and how we tackle them. And number one is PROMESA, which is the um, debt restructuring um, act that was approved in 2016. And PROMESA um, establishes a federal oversight management board that approves the Puerto Rican budget, the annual budget, even though it's comprised of a group of people that is not elected. Um, and um, it's an act that was supposed to ensure the payment uh, of a debt without uh, it being audited. And it, it put on hold, it produced a stay on all civil rights cases against at the government of Puerto Rico. So since 2016, uh, Puerto Ricans cannot uh, sue uh, or um, continue civil cases against any agency uh, in public agencies. This, this is the first challenge. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Louder. Yeah. Well, where can I get okay. a microphone? Okay. Sorry. No worries. No worries. Um, is there anyone that's a non English speaker? Yeah, we can't do that because then we won't have time to say all we want to say if we are also okay. translating. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, number the second uh, aspect that I wanted to highlight are the disasters, like the sequel of disasters. Hurricanes in 2017, Irma and Maria, earthquakes at the beginning of 2020, the pandemic um, in the spring of 2020, and then uh, the Hurricane Fiona in 2022. Within a context of a failed response, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but the US Civil Rights Commission uh, published a report on how failed this response was. Um, the third one is um, the government <laughs> has been um, in the best scenario unstable and the worst um, corrupt and, and, and ne ne negligent. Um, we've had three governors in six years, at least six um, high ranking officials investigated um, and, and indicted, six mayors, have been arrested in the past year or 18 months. 
and we had four different secretaries of the health department during the 12 months after COVID. Four different secretaries, four resignations of secretaries after March 14, 2020. That's all I'm gonna say about our government. <laughs> and the fourth is it's um it's the data. Um, I think this is the biggest challenge. Uh, we have unreliable, inaccurate, bias data that has a huge racial and gender bias, um, and that um, it's not available. It's never timely. Uh, if you want to know what happened. Um, you might find 2019, 2020 statistics online as we speak. Whoops! Oh, <laughs> yeah, these are for me the, the four the four challenges that are unique to the past six years in Puerto Rico that are important to understand in access to health and healthcare. Yes. Okay. Sure. Um, buenas tardes, everyone. And salud. <laughs> Challenges that I'm going um, I'm, I'm going to be quickly over it. Um, first, Puerto Rico lacks an, an, an economic architecture. Uh, that is something that is not readily seen. But in those countries where you see a consistent growth of the economy, you see at least three or four social elements functioning in coherence. Um, you will see, for us, of course, the most obvious one is education. Uh, you will see uh, health, the health system. Uh, you will see the, um, the development of a local industries of local businesses. So think of that and fourth, uh, the music and art. Um, and you will you will think, well, that is a sort a, a sort of an afterthought. Well, that the, the issue is then that you will see in those countries that shows economic prosperity, you will see in parallel. Uh, you will see solid music and the arts education program. Um, music, by the way, is a sort of a turbocharger for education. Uh, so, um, Puerto Rico had that uh, in 1940s, and what happened was that that crumbled down with a with a failed and flawed logic. And the flawed logic is you only stimulate one of the engines whether it be the production of employment and nothing else, uh, or whether it be um, the production of oil, or whether it be the import of capital. What happens with those isolated approaches? If you don't have an educated workforce, then you don't have people to work in the industries that are being imported to Puerto Rico. So that lasted up there in 1970. So the lack of, econ of a social architecture to support economic development, for me, is a major flaw uh, in our social design. Secondly, um, it's um, economic isolation. How does that come into the mix? Uh, if you're a colony, you're by definition isolated. Uh, Puerto Rico's um, international relations are confined to U.S. international relations. For example, we can, we can buy a lot of goods from the Dominican Republic, from Cuba, from, uh, from the neighbors. But you need to, all that, if we're, if we're going to buy it, it, it has to go through, uh, 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 through docks either in Florida or New Jersey. Um, and then a related pro problem is, the cabotage law. So you only you, your only choice to transport uh, basic goods to Puerto Rico is through ships with um, U.S. flag or American flag. So those are in the in the grand scheme. Those are 
major challenges in terms of uh, Puerto Rico's um, uh, economic development. And, and, and I'll, I'll come back to uh, I'll come back to the architecture because I, I, I think that, that the, the architecture is really the Aquila's heel of Puerto Rico's economy. Thank you. Connecting economic barriers to health outcomes. On August 13th, 2023, Benjamin Torres Gotay, a columnist for El Nuevo Día, one of the largest newspapers, newspaper on the island, wrote a column titled Morir en Maricao, which translates to to die in Maricao. Maricao is a municipality in the center of Puerto Rico. But for the sake of this argument, we could die in any municipality because of the dire state of the health system in Puerto Rico. To the fact that 25% of all our municipalities don't have basic medical urgent care after 10 p.m. A question to the panelists. How do you see the intersection between economic development and health in Puerto Rico? We start now with Dr. Kenny first. I mean, there, there, uh, I think the intersection is, um, can be easily, uh, easily seen. However, there are two pieces of research that I think is important, and those are recent research. One is by uh, Dr. Jose Caraballo Cueto and Dr. Isar Godron. Jose Caraballo Cueto is, um, I would say, is, is, a, is a most important economic thinker in Puerto Rico. And Isa Godro has developed her, her as an anthropologist her whole, whole career around the concept of polarism. So basically they ask the research question, does colorism make makes a difference regarding health access to health? Does that make a difference in Puerto Rico? So they research close to 500, uh, 5,000 uh, cases. Uh, doing statistic analysis and and then taking as as many Puerto Rican uh, know we have a color gradient uh, in Puerto Rico uh, you have from negro to Havana, uh from uh, dark skin to high yellow so it runs the gradient and 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 the, and the cultural understanding is the lighter you are uh, the worse the better social acceptance you will. So when you apply that same prism to health, uh, they found that the, the same relationship in terms of the color, color gradient. So uh, darker people, they will uh, present uh, uh, poor health, poorer health. Lighter people, they will present better indicators of health and wellness. So um, if you take that piece of information, then the, the Puerto Rico Community Foundation commissioned another piece of information. And we were looking at the Southern region uh, regarding unemployment. And pretty much when you, and, and they disaggregated the data uh, by, by color. Uh, and I'm using that concept regarding in relation to colors. So again, darker people will show five percentage points higher uh, in terms of unemployment and in terms of in income than lighter people. So if you connect the two, uh, then the, uh, darker people ends up in a very difficult situation regarding health and regarding economic level development. So that, that is a clear a clear connection, of course. They, 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 that generates a lot of uh, debates among researchers. Uh, but the reality is that there is a very clear connection that, that can be substantiated uh, by data. So I'll stop there with those, those two pieces of research, and I'll leave it to Penny. Yes. Um, I was uh, sharing with my colleagues earlier that I still get angry with data. I can't like look cold to data. I read the data and I get worked up and angry. I've cried literally 
um, confirming things. Like you suspect you have some level of, and then you, you read the data and it's just gut-wrenching still for me. <laughs> um, so I was, um, I, I was trying to uh, produce um, a concept for the connections between economic development and health that are not necessarily that obvious. Um, and I was thinking about health literacy, health access, and health availability. So in the case of Puerto Rico, uh, access would translate to insurance coverage or money to pay if you're an uninsured and transportation primarily. So Puerto Rico is a small uh, island of made up of isolated communities that have no way of connecting among each other because there is no um, island-wide public transportation system. So you rely on your neighbors, you rely on other people to give you a lift, or you rely, to, uh, or you rely um, in community health workers that knock your door and visit you. Uh, and literacy in Puerto Rico would mean enough understanding to participate in, at some level in decisions regarding health. Um, with what Dr. Colon was just explaining, you, you can imagine the levels um, of health literacy and the vulnerability it puts to people when you cannot participate in decisions about your health. Um, and then availability in Puerto Rico would mean the ratio of um, healthcare providers and patients, uh, the amount of training available for healthcare students to, to be trained on state to practice medicine in Puerto Rico. As we speak, there's a crisis in our, in our public, only public um, medicine school um, that involves decertification of crucial residency programs. And I'm just not gonna go there, but it's, uh, it's really bad. Um, and we also would have within availability, the, the, the level of fragmentation of the system. Uh, you are a healthcare provider that cannot practice medicine without proper labs, um, nuclear imaging centers, um, pharmacies, and, and, and so on. Um, so all of that is in very precarious state in Puerto Rico, and it was precarious before 2016, before the Federal Oversight Management Board was appointed, before Hurricane Maria um, was formed. Uh, so these disasters have just um, um, deepened uh, all the problems. And the other layer that I wanted to bring besides the racial um, lens that Dr. Gonom is bringing is, um, is the gender lens. Um, so even if you have car, insurance, money, literacy, and you live in a metropolitan area where you can drive to a pharmacy, a lab, and a doctor within reasonable amount of times, and you can find appointments and people that will uh, provide care, um, you are still living in a, in a society where um, we had, we've had 47 uh, femicides in 2023, and we are in September. Uh, 14 of those uh, have been intimate partner violence caused death, and 26 of those deaths are still under investigation. This is half of 2023. Right. And, that, and, and that's the Puerto Rico that we survive in. Um, so 53% of women, of Puerto Rico's population are women. 37 are under, uh, over 55 years of age. 64 are heads of households, uh, either because we're never married or because our widow or divorce. 43% have children under the 18. 37% are caretakers of someone over 60, even if they also have kids of their own. 
and of the of, of that percentage of women, the ones that uh, didn't finish university degrees, 66% live under the poverty line, 66% of those homes. Um, we conducted a study in, in Loisa. Uh, we interviewed over 350 um, homes, and we found that 50% of those homes, half of those homes, were uh, in vulnerable conditions, and 19% of those homes still had blue tarps. We did this research four years after Hurricane Maria, one year before Hurricane Fiona. We still had 19% of houses with blue tarps in Loisa. Um, so even if you can escape all of that, is what I'm trying to say, Puerto Rico has almost the same um, average of women's rate of employment since 1970. 1970, I'm talking 50 years with 30% average of participation. And, but of course, if you have children, uh, you're the caretaker of children and you have precarious school systems, if you can uh, have a dignified job, if you have people over 60 that you're also a caretaker, you can't, you just can't participate. Um, and so um, this, is the, um, this is the ecosystem in which we survive and sometimes thrive with the help of our neighbors and our friends and the communities, but it is dire and it is precarious and, um, and it is unfair. It, can be changed is what I'm trying to say. It's just not natural because sometimes I feel like we just, because we have to survive, we have we tolerate and accept, but it, it is unfair and wrong um, and it has to be changed. Thank you, thank you. So, so we have a picture of how we are living in Puerto Rico and how we are surviving. And sometimes we look up to find help or to, to decide to find help. But that's where the third sector comes in. Advancing community economic development as a social driver for health and well being. What is the third sector doing? Both organizations focused on community empowerment and resilience. We need resilience. Tell us more about your organization's approach on how do they foster community economic development as a social driver for health and well-being? Yeah, let, let me say a word uh, on, on gender, and that is gender and climate change. Uh, we were having a panel on climate change last week. And uh, what the UN data says is that um, uh, women has are, are more vulnerable to, to climate change. That is, uh, fires, earthquakes, um, uh, floods, uh, rain. But you would say uh, those are natural disasters. Uh, wrong. Those are social disasters that expose people to a higher level of vulnerability. Uh, so basically the conclusion of the UN report is since women has less access to, to resources, that is economic resources, uh, better housing and so on, therefore that make, 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 that make them more vulnerable to the impact of um, a natural disaster. So having said that, let us move to hope uh, enough description yeah. uh, of, of the problem. And um, so um, uh, two things. One, uh, when you look at the government, at least our government, and I would say, no, I, I would not be doing that. <laughs> but at least our government is not people-centered. Uh, the main driver of the government is to pay the public debt. Uh, so essentially, that means that you need to subtract resources from education, you need to subtract resources from, uh, from health, therefore, to generate enough 
uh, income to pay the public debt. Uh, it still is a failed proposition, but we are here. Um, so it, that was what Tamina was trying to avoid to say. Um, but it is the failed and absolutely flawed approach to the problem. Therefore, where, where is the hope? Where are the possibilities? Um, first, we need to recognize that the action or actionable uh, union in Puerto Rico uh, is the community. Essentially, that means where things happen, where the action is, where, where, where results are obtained is at the community level. So when you think, and then going to Iran, uh, uh, uh answer, when you think in terms of what are the strategies, the Puerto Rico Community Foundation as a social investor has developed its own architecture for communities in Puerto Rico. And that architecture has like um, uh, six points of entry. Um, uh, the, in, in, in the um, most uh, optimum scenario, uh, you will be investing in those six points. But essentially, you will be looking at uh, the development of human capital education. You will be looking at health in conjunction with your education. You will be looking at social capital. Essentially meaning some, sometimes people tend to not to give the importance that social capital have, have for the well-being uh, of society. But the social capital is the glue, is the connector, is where you achieve cohesiveness. When you don't have that, you have a degrading of your human. Uh, and, and then you look at the cultural aspect of, of it. While culture is, is so important, as I was saying, for music and the arts, they, they, they are potentiators, they are uh, turtles for people will be. Um, so then, then you need to look at, uh, at the relation uh, uh, with your environment. We all want to live in a clean environment. If you don't live in a clean environment, you lose people. People just move out. Um, so that needs to be uh, a major and central piece. And as a result of all that, then you need a, a business engine, a local business engine. When you look at countries that grow at a consistent, consistent pace, um, Vietnam, uh, Eastern Europe countries, uh, the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean, they have a lot of a small business. Uh, operating at the community level. So the architecture uh, really needs to consider all six elements. In absence of one of those elements, or if you focus ex uh, uniquely on, like we did in Puerto Rico, either, manuf no, either manufacturing or the oil, or uh, importing, uh, as we are doing now, uh, importing investors to Puerto Rico, those are failed strategies because you cannot have economic development until you have all the six engines working in conjunction. Gracias. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, um, okay. Um, so talking about the role of community empowerment and community resilience to bridge these gaps, so to speak, I'd say we believe two things. And uh, we just live by those beliefs. <laughs> we believe women are the drivers of community resilience and development. Um, and so that means that we need to listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to listen because they are wise and they are strong and they survive a lot of things. So um, the motor, the, the, the driver, the, the, the force of nature to um, push forward 
um, processes for the common good. And so that uh, is, I would say that's our norms. That's, that, that's what orients our work and how we relate to each other. The other thing that we believe is that only a dignified life is the only social driver that you need to improve health outcomes at all levels, at all dimensions, and intersections of health. And so when we say dignified life, uh, we mean um, lives that, um, that, ay, como se dice, that uh, enjoy um, wellness, that, um, uh, that see well-being of people as a right. Mm -hmm. And that means that you build that infrastructure <laughs> that Dr. Colom is talking about to actually have available, accessible, reliable health services. You have, you protect reproductive rights, you protect safe abortion care services. You make sure your lives are free from all forms of violence. You, you um, protect available and equitable education. You make sure there is safe and affordable housing. You produce um, employment conditions of dignity and you have always available, accessible, reliable data. You cannot evaluate and modify without data that is unbiased. <laughs> um, so that for us would be um, the way, right? Uh, at least to start um, producing stomach equilibrium and balance. Because right now, um, I mean, we um, we do our work sometimes only with love. Um, and it's amazing what our sector can do only with love and with people um, uh, putting the be their best versions to service. But that's not enough to build sustainable infrastructure for everyone, not only the people we can reach. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're trying to build this collective power to protect, to expand the good policies and also to change the policies that hurt our communities and also to, to create spaces to co-design a, a more equitable Puerto Rico. Um, so, um, so what I'm trying to say is in a way, we are aware of the problems and of the scale and size of the problems. That don't stop us, it never has. <laughs> uh, even in the most dire of circumstances, it never stopped us from getting up and out to work. But um, sometimes, you know, we, we can defend joy because we are a joyful people and we can defend hope. Um, but at some point there has to be a real public commitment to push this forward. Um, this is just hurting a lot of people. Um, and it, it's, all, it's out there for us to see that it's also benefiting <laughs> some people. <laughs> um, so that's the question where we sit in right now, right? How do we keep doing this from love and joy and hope and also demand accountability? Because <laughs> um, my, my daughter is 11, so I have an urgency. Yeah. I, I don't have more uh, patience to wait for things, you know, that I think her generation deserves. So that's where we're at. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Pero aquí en, en Puerto Rico se le dice la ñapa. Okay. La ñapa is something extra that you get of the hospitality of your guests. 
So based on what we already have said, the poll question from Wolga audience uh, says that what are the differences in the inequities of Afro-Puerto Ricans as compared to those that are non-African based? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take that. Um, yeah, there are uh, several studies that uh, point to that difference regarding employment, regarding business development, regarding other areas. How do they do that? Uh, researchers have divided Puerto Rico, has created, has created an inequality index. And um, and that inequality index looks at looks at access to health, um, employment generation, uh, infrastructure, and um, there, there, there's a fourth one that is still in my mind. Uh, so uh, they were able, and again, I'm just working with them, uh, to create a sort of x-ray of Puerto Rico. So when you look at what I was mentioning in the morning, at the settlement, of um, you know, um, Afro Boricuas, Afro Puerto Ricans, there is the coincidence between the, the uh, inequality index and those locations that are starting Luisa and goes, uh, runs towards, towards the east uh, until Jabucoa, then there is uh, an enclave, enclave uh, in Ponce. Um, so that is empirically demonstrated. Uh, so that, that is a difference that can, can be calculated uh, in percentages uh, regarding income, regarding housing, regarding uh, the other measures of the um, uh, vulnerability uh, index. Of course, if you look at the center of the island where you have uh, municipalities that are non-Black, uh, you will see a uh, similar uh, vulnerability. However, the question is, uh, in those black municipalities, what is the difference? And there is in fact a difference. Um, so it has been a research, it has been studied. Um, and, and, and then the, the, this most recent piece of research uh, regarding health conditions of dark skin, light skin, Puerto Rican, sort of supports um, uh, the, the, the conclusion of those studies. So there, there are fundamental differences, but it's measured not in different kind of economic measures, but rather in percentages uh, regarding comparing, of course, apples and apples, people with similar education, people with similar uh, conditions and, and, and so on. But yes, there, there, there is a, a, an empirically proven difference Black population in Puerto Rico and lighter skin, as skin in Puerto Ricans. I can maybe add that um, one difference that I find very um, important is that, at least in the experience of Puerto Rico, there was a lot of energy and resources invested in a particular storytelling that says that all Puerto Ricans are part of a mixture of races. Mm -hmm. And this storytelling um, erases, um, technically erases um, Black identities in Puerto Rico and um, has done it so effectively that we don't collect that data. So you, you cannot choose to identify yourself as an Afro-Puerto Rican. There, that it just doesn't exist at the category. So when you're seeking for services, if you are incarcerated, if you are part of the public health uh, system, if you are part of the public education system, there is no data for us to understand the experience of being a Black Puerto Rican. And so, so that's the technical part. The symbolical part is the one where if Black identity doesn't exist, neither does racism. 
So if you feel discriminated, it's probably something you imagined. Uh, so it's in your mind. You're experiencing imaginary racism. And so to what the experience of racism is, because it's unacknowledged. And it's totally unacknowledged. I invite you to do a, an experiment asking to lighter skins Puerto Ricans about the, the experience of racism in Puerto Rico. And you'll be surprised what you'll hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not their fault. <laughs> I mean, there's a responsibility that all of us have to make, uh, but it is, it's really the result of a network, a well-resourced, long-standing effort to erase that identity. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is um, there is this study centering Black uh, Latinidad, a very good one, coming out of a Latino policy and, and politics institute. And um, they have a very clear in, 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 in definition of what race is. And basically, the definition is if you see yourself Black, and if other people see you black, then you're black. <laughs> Something like that. Um, if you see yourself white, and other people see you white, then you are white. And that creates a social difference in interaction because the other and you both know uh, who's at the top and who's at the bottom. So that's an interesting piece of information that this is uh, supported then by the difference in education, health, and 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 and, and so on. Um, so that would that one piece, and I just forgot the other <laughs> piece. <laughs> so thank you. We'll have some little time for any closing remarks from the families if you want to. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'd say that um, to all of you that are not a Puerto Rico residents, um, we, we appreciate uh, the effort in trying to understand what happens in Puerto Rico, because I know that what goes out as news not necessarily produce knowledge of what really goes on in Puerto Rico and to really be able to be an ally, um, uh, there has to be uh, some, some level of effort into really trying to understand and get to a point where you say, yeah, that's, you know, that's how it looks like. Um, and so uh, we can do what we can do, but with allies, we can do a lot more. <laughs> so, um, so thank you for listening and for being here and for being interested and for telling others about uh, Puerto Rico's reality and uh, our organization's work. And, and bienvenidos, bienvenida siempre. Thank you, Tania, for saying that. We didn't research this. We didn't rehearse this. It's not, it's not rehearsed. But uh, what I was going to say is, um, just following on on, on, on Daniel's lead. Um, part, part of the problem of racism is that we 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 have learned to view ourselves as isolated groups of people. So that is Black Americans, that is um, Blacks in Central America, Blacks in Puerto Rico, and Blacks in the, uh, in Latin America. So my invitation is uh, that we start viewing ourselves as part of that big African diaspora. We are all uh, daughters and sons of, of Africa. Uh, so once we see ourselves as part of those 200 million people that are going through the same experience, uh, similar experiences, then we can see the 45 million um, yeah, in, the, in the US. Within that, the 2.5 million of Afro-Latinos. 
And interestingly enough, Afro Latinos and Black Americans are forging a very interesting daily alliances. Uh, and we perhaps we we all know some friends or by personal experience where that alliance is creating a new identity. Uh, so my invitation is let's see ourselves as part of that larger community belonging to that larger community of 200 million African descendants in this chemistry here. And that is the largest group, by the way, in the chemistry. Thank you. Well, this concludes this breakout of local perspective on economic challenges in relation to Puerto Rico. Thank you. And have a nice evening. And que la pasen bien.